Hi everyone, my name is Branislav Beret. Welcome to Nitrania Game Club. And you're watching the Game in a Nutshell series of videos designed to teach various board games. Today we will take a look at the game called Gugong, which is a very interesting worker placement, card placement game. It has a lot of symbology, but the gameplay is actually very simple. Here's how it plays. Place the board in the middle of the table. Based on the number of players, choose the corresponding side of the game board. We will set up a three-player game. Then shuffle the seven gift cards with this symbol and place them randomly on all the seven gift card locations on the game board. Shuffle all the travel tokens and randomly place one token face up on each city on the travel location. These are special bonus travel tokens and if this is your first game, I would recommend not to use them at all. When you place a travel token on each location, stack the remaining travel tokens on these spots face down. Place one jade token on all these six spots and all the remaining jade tokens into this general supply. Sort the decree tokens by their value on their back and then place two from each stack on these indicated spots. You can put the remaining tiles back into the box, they will not be used in this game. Roll the three destiny dice and place them on these indicated spots and then place this day tracker on the first space of the track. Finally, place this next first player token to this spot. Then give each player the player board, six servants represented by these cubes and six more servants into the supply next to the board. Also, place this double servant on the indicated spot. Each player will also receive these three ships in his color. Then all the players put their victory point markers here. All the envoys will start at the gates of the palace. All the intrigue markers are placed to the starting location. And all the traveler tokens are placed next to the board. And as a last step of the setup, each player will get four gift cards. Randomly determine the start player and he will get this token. He will get these four gift cards with this symbol of the fan with only one spot of the black color. The second player will receive these four cards with two segments of the fan filled with black color. The third player will receive these four cards and eventually fourth and fifth player those next ones. Then shuffle the gift cards with this uh, yin yang symbol and place them face down somewhere near the table. And that's the end of this long setup and we are ready to play. The essence of this game are these gift cards which both players have in their hand and some of them are randomly distributed on the game board. Players will change their card from the hand for the card on the game board, which allows them to take actions in that specific locations. Players will travel across the lands, collect jade tokens, build the Great Wall, gain certain decreases, move up on the Intrigue track, move up on the Emperor track and navigate their ships in the Grand Canal in order to get victory points. The player with the most victory points wins the game. The game is played over four rounds. And each round has the morning phase, which is skipped in the first round because it's actually part of the setup. Then there is the day phase, which is actually an action phase. And then the night phase, which is some kind of end of round phase. The morning phase is executed in this order and, as I already said, it is skipped in the first round. In all the subsequent rounds, first determine the start player. If any player took this start player token in the previous round, he take this bigger token and becomes a start player. If nobody took this token in the previous round, the start player doesn't change. Next, if there are any empty travel locations and that means without a traveler or without the travel tokens. Draw new travel tokens and place them on these empty spaces. 
If this draw pile runs out, simply shuffle all the discarded travel tokens and create a new pile. As a third step in the morning phase, simply re-roll these destiny dice. Once re-rolled, place them in their corresponding spaces. Then execute the advantages of this morning decrease. Those morning decrees have this rising sun symbol. All players who have servants next to these morning decrees receive these advantages. The starting player receives the advantages first and then is followed by all players in a clockwise order. And as a final step of the morning phase, players will receive servants. If this would be the morning phase of the second day, move the day tracker to the second place and all players now receive four servants. Players would receive their servants from their general supply. During the day phase, starting with the first player and then going clockwise, players will play their gift cards from their hand and exchanging them with the gift cards on the board. If you have at least one card in your hand, you must exchange this card and perform an action. When you have no more cards in your hand, because all your cards are discarded, you must pass. If all players have passed, the day phase is over and the night phase begins. At the start of your turn, choose one of the cards from your hand and exchange that card with any other card on the game board. Place your card on the game board and the card from the game board goes into your discard pile face down. These face down cards will become available for you at the beginning of the next round. You can look into your discard pile anytime, but your opponents may not see your discard pile. Now, when you exchange cards, ideally your card has higher value than the card on the game board. If that's the case, you can freely use the action of the gift card and then also the action of the location. You can perform one or the other or both and when you perform both, the action on the gift card must be the first one and then the action of the location. Notice that some of the gift cards, especially the high value ones, have no actions available. In this case, I could first execute the action of Palace of the Purity, which is this location, and it would allow me to move one step up on this track. And then I could use the action of the location and move my traveler one step further. We will cover these action of locations in a moment. If your gift card has the same value or even lower value than the gift card on the game board, you have three options. You may discard two servants from your supply into the general supply or instead of that you may discard any other card from your hand into your discard pile or as a third option, you exchange the card, but you don't perform any action at all. There's one exception to this rule. When you exchange your value 1 card with the value 9 card from the game board, you can freely do this exchange and perform both actions on the gift card and on the location. The travel action allows you to take your traveler token place it and then move it across this land to get various bonuses or victory points. After you place your gift card and perform the gift card action, you can then perform the location action. You can find the available actions over here. You can either choose the first one or the second one which is more powerful. There's a lot of symbols in the game and you can find the explanations of the symbols in the rulebook. We will only explain just a few of those in this video. When you choose the first travel action, you can move your traveler icon one space. If you want to activate the bottom action, which is more powerful, first you have to discard two servants from your pool into your general supply. This requirement is indicated by this cube with the red number two. When you spend your servants, you can move your traveler token two spaces forward. 
When you first take the travel action, you can place your traveler token anywhere you want. Immediately claim the travel token which is underneath your traveler and receive its benefit. White number, this one or this one, indicates how many servants you can move from your general supply back into your pool. Also, put the token you have collected to the designated space on your player board. When you take the next travel action, you have to follow these paths. You can skip through empty spaces and also through spaces occupied by other players. When you take this advanced action and you execute double movement, make the first move, claim the token and take its benefit, and then perform the second move and claim another token and get that benefit as well. Again, add the claim tokens to your player board. At any time during the game, you can exchange the travel tokens for these benefits. You can discard two tokens to get one servant from the general supply to your pool, or discard four tokens to get two victory points immediately, or you can discard six tokens for one jade. If your player board is full, and you would have to add another travel token, you must perform one of these trades immediately. Place the discarded tokens next to the player board. Do not add them to the draw pile yet. Only when the draw pile is completely empty, shuffle the discarded tokens and create a new pile. When you take the Great Wall action, you may add your servants to this track helping to build the Great Wall. Let's take a look at the iconology again. This symbol means that you can take one servant from your pool and add him to the Great Wall track. When you take this bottom action, first you need to discard one of the servants from the pool to the general supply and then take two additional servants which you can add to the Great Wall. This symbol means that instead of one servant, you can spend the long double servant, which we will cover at the end of the video. When you place your servant on the corresponding place on the track, so in a three-player game it's this one, the section of the Great Wall will be built and the Great Wall will be scored. The player who has the most servants on the Great Wall receives three victory points immediately and may move his envoy one step higher. In case there is a tie, the intrigue track serves as a tie breaker. Whoever reached the higher number on the track is the winner. In case the markers would be on the same spot, the marker on the top is the winner. Right after that, as this symbology indicates, all players who have servants on the Great Wall can take the Intrigue benefits. Starting with the player who is lowest on the track, players may move the marker indicated number of positions down and receive the appropriate benefit. If the white player would choose to reduce the position by three spots, he may take two servants from his general supply back to his pool. Finally, the player who scored the Great Wall removes his servants from the Great Wall and places them into the general supply. If this created any gaps, slide the servants towards the start of the track. When you take the Jade action, you have to remove a certain number of servants from your pool to your general supply Take a Jade token and put him next to your player board. The number of servants you need to spend depends on the spot from which you take the Jade token. In case all these three locations are empty, you can always take Jade tokens from this general supply for five servants. This general supply is considered to be unlimited, so in case you run out of the Jade tokens, use something else as a replacement. When you take the Intrigue action, you can move your Intrigue marker one step up and also take this Start Player token. 
This means that you will be the start player next turn. Alternatively, you can spend one servant to move your intrigue marker three steps up. In case you land on a space which is already occupied by another marker, put your marker on the top. As I have mentioned before, the intrigue track serves as a tiebreaker for any ties in the game. And when the Great Wall section is built, players can take these intrigue benefits. Intrigue track has 14 spots and once you reach the spot number 14, you cannot move any further. When you take the palace action, you can move your envoy one step closer to the emperor, which is very important because only those players who reach this place can win the game. When you spend two servants, you can take the more powerful action, which allows you to move your envoy two spaces up and also to move your intrigue marker one place further. When you reach the Emperor, place your marker to the spot with the highest available number of victory points. And now you have fulfilled one of the requirements to win the game. In case you would have to move any further spaces up, instead gain one victory point for any move that you cannot complete. When the next player reaches the Emperor place, again place him to the next spot with the highest available victory points. The palace has a space for all players, and so all the players have a chance to win the game. When you take the Decree action, you can gain one of these Decrees. Now, this symbology may seem a little confusing, but its meaning is actually very simple. When you want to gain a decree, you need to spend certain number of servants. You need to spend number of servants depicted on the decree, plus one servant for each of the opponent's cube already present there. So in this case, it would be one plus one, two servants, which you move from your pool to your general supply, and then take another one, and place him to the corresponding space. From now on, you can gain the benefits of this decree. To gain this decree, you would have to spend one plus two, that's three servants, plus one more, which would be placed here. These servants remain here until the end of the game. Also, you can only gain each decree once, so it is not allowed to gain it multiple times. Level 1 Decrees provide benefits during the Morning Phase, Level 2 Decrees provide benefits during the Action Phase, and Level 3 Decrees provide victory points at the end of the game. Again, you can find the explanation of all Decrees in the rulebook. When you take the Grand Canal action, you can deploy ships with your servants down this canal, to obtain these depicted bonuses. When you take the first action, you can place one servant from the pool onto the ship and then move the ship. You can place a servant on one ship and move another ship. You may decide to use only one of those actions, so either adding a servant or only moving a ship. You don't need to perform both of them. When you take the second action, you have to discard one of the servants first and then you can add two more servants and put them onto your ship. You can add both of them to one ship or one of them to one ship and another one to another ship. Or if you have a ship available, you can take that ship, place it on the first available spot on the Grand Canal and add the servant onto this new ship. Adding a new ship to the Grand Canal is not considered a movement. Each ship must have at least one servant and maximum three servants. When you want to move the ship, there has to be at least one harbor which is empty. When you move the ship, you have to move to the next available space. If you would move this ship in this situation, you can only move to this harbor. When you reach a harbor with the bonus and your ship has three servants, you can claim that bonus. There are three types of bonuses on the Grand Canal. It's victory points, new gift card, or a double servant. The last harbor provides benefit of your choice. First harbor is a starting point and doesn't provide any bonus. 
When you decide to claim the bonus, take your servants and the ship away from the canal, claim the bonus, which in this case take the new gift card, return the ship back to your player board, and from those three servants put two of them into the general supply and one of them to the designated space on the left side of your player board. These spots indicate how many times you can claim the bonus. You can claim the double servant only one time, you can get new gift card two times, and you can get four victory points total three times. Now let's briefly talk about this double servant. When you claim the double servant, move this double servant back to your pool. You can use him in various ways. First of all, when you need to spend two servants, instead of spending two single servants, you can simply spend one double servant. Then do you remember this icon from the Great Wall section? This tells you that when you add one servant to the Great Wall, you can actually place this double servant as one token. However, for the scoring purposes, it counts as two servants. In addition, when you take the bottom action and you are allowed to add two servants, one of them can be the double servant and the other one can be a single servant. The same applies to a grand kennel. You can also take one servant and use your double servant counting as two servants. When you have your double servant in the general supply and you are allowed to move one servant from the general supply to your pool, you can also move the double servant. When all players run out of the gift cards and all the gift cards are in the discard piles, the day phase is over and the night phase begins. The night phase has two steps. In the first step, players compare the values of their cards with the destiny dice. Card by card, compare the card value with the numbers on the destiny dice. If the card value matches the destiny die value, you get one servant. This card also matches the value, it's another one. And for this card matching this value, it's the third servant. In case there are more destiny dice with the same value, each card that matches the value will actually give you two servants. The second card with the four value also matches two dice, which means two more servants. And then for these sevens, that's another servant. All these servants are added from the general supply to the player's pool. As indicated by this symbology, the player who received the most servants during this first step will get a bonus of three victory points immediately, plus he can move his envoy one step further. In case of a tie, use the intrigue track. The second step of the night phase, and actually the last step of each round, is to move the ships. Starting with the last ship, each ship will move one space further. If there is a ship at the fifth spot, it actually moves out of the board and is returned back to the player's general supply. All other ships simply move one space further. If you have a ship with three servants on it and the ship arrives at the destination, you can immediately choose to take the benefit. If you do, claim the reward and return the ship with the servants to your supply. And that's the end of the round and the new round can begin with the morning phase. If this would be the end of the fourth round, the game would end and you can proceed to final scoring. First, if there are any remaining servants on the Great Wall, do the scoring normally but without the intrigue benefits. So whoever has the majority here get three points and can even move the envoy one step higher. Then add the victory points from the level 3 decrease and from the Palace of Heavenly Purity. Now, remember that any player who has not reached the Emperor place will actually score 0 points. You have to reach the Emperor in order to win the game. And finally, add the victory points for the Jade tokens as indicated by this table. In this case, for 4 Jade tokens, 
player would receive 10 points. Whoever has the most points wins the game. In case of a tie, use the intrigue track as a tiebreaker. So that's how you play Gugong. As I said, this game has a lot of symbology, a lot of icons, but you can find everything in this rulebook at the back of the rulebook. And uh, after a few rounds, I believe those icons will become like a second nature. It's, it's easy to understand. So if you have any questions, comments, uh, put them into the comment sections. I'll be more than happy to answer them. If you like this series, please subscribe. My name is Branislav Berec. You've been watching the game in a nutshell and see you next time.